one of the best things about working in the lab in Cambridge are the people I work with. Out of the 70 or so people I work with there, one third of them came from other countries. We had Finnish, Swedish, Japanese, Germans, Italians, Brazilians, Maltese, Sudanese, Australians, Austrians, Spanish, Americans, and he was, there was even one Welsh bloke there as well. And it was only after spending time with people from all different walks of life that you realise how ignorant I was before I started working there. All of us have impressions of people that we absorb from the society around us. Silly things, really. And if we stop and think about these assumptions, they all make very little sense. We only believe such things, basically, because we're ignorant. And it is this ignorance that drives our misconceptions. After spending time with people who are different to us, we feel silly and sometimes ashamed of what we once believed about them. Growing up in the valleys, I had only ever met two people who went to public school, and these were friends of mine that left our school and went off to a public school in Brecon. One lad went to elocution lessons to get rid of his accent before he went to public school, and as you can imagine, this didn't go down really well with the rest of us. This fixed in all our minds a negative impression of people who went to public school, a place where people went because they thought they were better than us, snobby kids who looked down on us in the valleys. And this impression was fixed in my mind for years without even thinking about it. So imagine my distress when I began working in Cambridge with people who were from public school. My ignorance had created an imaginary barrier and an imaginary hurt which I put onto all my workmates. And suffice to say that after a few weeks, this all disappeared. We were people from different worlds really, but the differences after a while became a positive thing and we were both better people for it. As a priest, I come across this sort of ignorance all the time. Last week, someone told me that God was the first mass murderer. Oh, that's a new one. I thought about that. And then we had somewhat of a surreal conversation, which God was described as a kind of psychopath. And it was described really in some detail. This person thought that in church, we worship this mass murdering God. And he was quite pleased with himself that this idea that he'd read was real in his own mind. As if for thousands of years, stupid, ignorant people had worshipped this mass murdering God, and now clever people like him had finally worked it out and freed themselves from this psycho God. On the other hand, I, as a priest, was still terrified of this God. So after this conversation, I went on the internet and I found that this is a great new theory, really, in America. Lots of books have been written about it. And it seems to be based on the Noah's Ark story. And it's a response to this new film that came out a few months ago. In a way, I see the point that the Noah story, if it is a literal historical account, that the God behaves in a psychopathic way. And if God behaved like that all the way through the Bible, then yes, God would be a psycho. But God doesn't do that. And the Noah story isn't a literal historical account. It's a symbolic story based on a folk memory of an ancient flood. Many other cultures in the region have similar stories, really. But this is just, is this just modern Christians messing about with a story to make it more acceptable in our age? Is it that in the past people took this story far more literally? But the fact is that the Noah story with Noah's Ark has never been taken literally and has only been taken literally by fundamentalists in the last hundred years or so. For a start, Noah is 900 years old and this is to show that it is a symbolic story. Also, if we read the works of the saints of the church, we find that all the early church fathers took this story symbolically. Even today, in our second reading, which you read earlier, we see that the Noah story is symbolically shown pointing towards our baptism. So the writer of the letter of Peter takes this story symbolically. 
The story means that like all parents, God gets fed up with his kids, but he will never abandon them. And there's loads of stories like this all the way through the Bible. The ark symbolizes the church or symbolizes heaven, which God calls us into. The part of the church that the people sit in is called the nave, which means boat. And if you look up, if you're sitting in the nave, you see the roof and it looks like an upturned boat. The story means that God calls us out of the storms of life to the safety of the ark. And that is what our second reading from Peter tells us. But what of all these, all those who don't listen to God, including us for that matter from time to time? Is there a point where God has just had enough of us and will send us to hell? Now the answer is found in our reading from Peter. Peter says that Jesus descends to preach to those who are in prison. And this, again, is in the Apostles' Creed, one of the foundational documents of Christianity, where we say in it that Jesus descends to the dead. So even in death, Jesus does not give up on us. Jesus calls us forever into the ark of heaven and in this life into the ark of the church. That's the whole point. Now, outside our church, there's a sign that says, all are welcome. All are welcome into the ark. Jesus is calling all people to be with him in the ark. Our job in the church is to do the same, to be like Jesus and to welcome people. So if the assessment of God as a mass murderer is wrong, why do people think it? And possibly for two reasons, and these are the same reasons why I don't like, or I didn't like, people from public school. I didn't like public school kids because I was ignorant of them. I just didn't know anybody who went to public school. Same as the mass murdering God. If you are ignorant, you will believe all sorts of things about others. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I didn't like public school kids because the only one I did meet was a bit snobby. And then I projected onto the whole group that little bit of hurt from years ago. Now, can we in the church be unwelcoming? Can we behave badly? Can we project a negative image of God? And as I said the other week, people won't read the Bible, but they will read us. In the beginning of today's reading, we see how to respond to people. If we respond with welcome and care to people, then they will see God in us. Yes, we do make mistakes. Yes, we do behave badly. And yes, the worst aspects of Christianity are projected for all to see. But the only way to change that is not through words, but through deeds. If we love those who think badly of us, perhaps in time they will see the reality and feel a bit silly, just like I do now about my friends who went to public school.